Book Two, Chapter Four of Clara Vaughan, Volume One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Clara Vaughan, Volume One by R. D. Blackmore. Book Two, Chapter Four. The farmer, his wife, and little Sally were now all I had to love. Poor Anne Maples, though thoroughly honest and faithful, was of a nature so dry and precise that I respected rather than loved her. I am born to love and hate with all my heart and soul, although a certain pride prevents me from exhibiting the better passion, except when strongly moved. That other feeling, sown by Satan, he never allows me to disguise. To leave the only three I loved was a bitter grief, to tell them of my intention a sore puzzle. But, after searching long for a good way to manage it, the only way I found was to tell them bluntly, and not to cry if it could be helped. So, when Mrs. Huxtable came in full glory to try upon me a pair of stockings of the brightest blue ever seen, which she had long been knitting on the sly for winter wear, I thanked her warmly, and said, "'Dear me, Mrs. Huxtable, how they will admire these in London!' "'In London, Sheel? She always called me her child since I had lost my mother.' They'll never see the likes of they in Lunnon, without they gets one of them their long glaskies, same as preventive chaps has, and then I reckon there'll be Hexymoor between, and Dartmoor too, for aught I know, and ever so many church towers and milestones. Oh, yes, they will. I shall be there in a week. In Lunnon and awake! Dear heart alive, child! Don't he tell on so! She thought my wits were wandering, as she had often fancied of late, and set off for the larder, which was the usual course of her prescriptions but I stopped her so calmly that she could not doubt my sanity. "'Yes, dear Mrs. Huxtable, I must leave my quiet home where all of you have been so good and kind to me, and I have already written to take lodgings in London.' "'Oh, Mrs. Clurer, dear, I can't believe it nohow. Come and discourse with Farmer about it. He knows a power more than I do, though I says it as shouldn't. But if so be he hearkens to the like of that, I'll comb him with the toasting iron.' Giving me no time to answer, she led me to the kitchen. The farmer, who had finished his morning's work, was stamping about outside the threshold, wiping his boots most carefully with a pitchfork and a rope of twisted straw. This process, to his great discomfort, Mrs. Huxtable had at length enforced by many scoldings, but now she snatched the pitchfork from him and sent it flying into the court. "'Won't thee never larn thee get dromedary not to stawn her an hour, muckin' out of the place?' "'Wool, wool,' said the farmer, looking at the pitchfork first and then at me. Reckon the old mare's dead at last. Case in thee dream of nothing but bosses and asses, thee girt moo. Here's Miss Clurer, as was like a chill of my own, and now she am going away, and us'll never see her no more. What dost thee mean, woman? asked the farmer sternly. Hast thee dared to go a jarin of her, same as thee did Zook? Oh, no, farmer, I answered quickly. Mrs. Huxtable never gave me an unkind word in her life, but I must leave you all and go to live in London. The farmer looked as if he had lost something, and began feeling for it in all his pockets. Then, without a word, he went to the fire and unhung the crock which was boiling for the family dinner. This done, he raked out the embers on the hearthstone, and sat down heavily on the settle with his back towards us. Presently we heard him say to himself, "'If any chill of mine ate's ever a bit of bacon to-day, I'll bile em on that there pot, and to see the copy our Sally wrote this very morning.' "'Wonderful, wonderful!' cried Mrs. Huxtable. And now her'll not know a pea from a pot hook, and little Jack can spell cider same as them does in London town. Dang London town, said the farmer savagely. And arl as lives there, lave out the Duke of Wellington. It's where the devil lives and him catches him breath and lanterns. My father told me that, and her never spake a lie. But it ain't for the learning I'd be vexed to lose my dearie. That last word he dwelt upon so tenderly and sadly that I could stop no longer, but ran up to him bravely with the tears upon my face. As I sat low before him on little Sally's stool, he laid his great hand on my head, with his face turned toward the settle, and asked if I had any one to see me righted in the world but him. I told him none whatever, and the answer seemed at once to please and frighten him. "'Then don't ee be a goin', my dear heart. Don't ee think no more a goin'. If it be for the bit and trap thee ates and drinks, doesn't thee know by this time our own flesh and blood bain't no more welcome to it? And us has a plenty here, and more nor a plenty.' And if us hadn't, Jan Huxtable himself and Honor Huxtable his wife would live on peg mile better nor they deserves, and gay it arl to they, and bless thee for aintin' of it. Ay, that us would, as fay, 
answered Miss Huxtable, coming forward. "'And if it be for change and pleasure and seeing of the world, I've seen a dale in my time, axing your pardon, miss, for conversing so to you. And what hath it been, even at Coombe Market, with the warmers I'd a knowed from little Charlers up? No better nor a harrow dill for a little cool to suck. I'd liefer know thee was a goin' to Trentisoe Churchyard, where little Jane and Winnie be, than let thee go to London Town, same as this there be.' "'And what would thy poor mother say, if so be her could hear tell of it?' At this moment, when I could say nothing, being thoroughly convicted of ingratitude, and ashamed before natures far better than my own, dear little Sally, who had been rolling on the dairy floor, recovered from the burst of childish grief, enough to ask whether it had any cause. Up to me she ran, with great pearl tears on the veining of her cheeks, and peeping through the lashes of her violet-blue eyes, she gave me one long reproachful look as if she began to understand the world, and to find it disappointment. Then she buried her flaxen head in the homespun apron I had lately taken to wear, and sobbed as if she had spoiled a dozen copies. What happened afterwards I cannot tell. Crying I hate, but there are times when nothing else is any good. I only know that, as the farmer left the house to get, as he said, a little brise, these ominous words came back from the court. "'Twould be a bad job for Tom Grundy if her come across me now.' End of Book 2, Chapter 4